everybody. Thank you for joining us for our live webinar with Relevant Gold Corp, where we will get to know more about the company, their values, projects, strategies, and many more. I will be your host for today. My name is Joe Sell from Emerging Markets Capital, a Hong Kong-based private investment firm that invests in mining equities in TSX and ASX. We are very excited to have and introduce to you Relevant Gold. Before we start, I would like to create a disclaimer that everything that will be said in this webinar are for informational purposes only. Relevant Gold Corp is a unique North American project generator junior explorer hybrid business model developing gold and precious metal projects throughout the USA. The current portfolio is focused on discovering district scale, high-grade gold deposits through a new eyes on old rocks approach. Our speaker for today is Rob Bergman, the CEO and co-founder of Relevant Gold Corp. He is a professionally trained geologist who has over 13 years of exploration and mineral development experience across North America on commodities including gold, silver, copper, nickel, uranium, industrial minerals, and rare earth elements. Besides Relevant Gold, Rob is also the president and co-founder of several privately held innovative mineral resource companies, including Exol Recycling Technologies, F3 Gold, and Relevant Copper Corp. He also has a Bachelor of Science in Geology from Winona State University and is a member of the Society of Economic Geologists, Society of Mining, Metallurgy and Exploration, and several other mineral resource related organizations. Our live webinar will last for an hour where we will cover about relevant gold for 35 minutes. And if anybody of you have any questions, please leave them in the Q&A box or send them to jr at emarcot.com and we will answer them during the Q&A session, which will last for 15 minutes. Alongside with me today is my co-host Jorge, who is the founder and managing director of EMC, Jorge, would you like to say something before we begin? Thank you, Giselle, and, and, and great to, to see everyone. And uh, great to see everybody who's joining us from uh, all over Asia. And I think some people who are typically based here, but now spending some more time in North America as well. So thank you uh, for making the time to listen to this uh, webinar. We, we will also be putting out a, a recording of the webinar and sending it out to, to all of you afterwards. But um, uh, Rob, it's, it's great to, to, to have you. I uh, just uh, had an opportunity to meet Rob for the first time uh, a few months ago. And we have a lot of uh, common interests and a lot of uh, the, the, the person who actually introduced us was uh, Peter McGaw, yep. who speaks very, very highly of Rob. Uh, he told me about um, Relevant Gold when he was still a private company. I was, uh, had the opportunity to invest in Rob's company um, before uh, it went public and realized something that I personally find incredibly exciting, which is this you know, district scale, uh, very you know, scientific approach to exploration that um, you know, the, when, when it works, it, it can reveal uh, huge deposits and huge districts. And um, I also had an opportunity to, you know, uh, for those of you who know, I'm, I'm the CEO of Raina Silver, and uh, Rob has uh, been an advisor to us uh, through his team, uh, especially our project in Medicine Springs. So through that relationship, uh, you know, we, we got a, an opportunity to, to get to know each other. Uh, and I was very, very impressed with Relevant Gold. And I thought it'd be a good opportunity to, you know, to let uh, all, all those of you who follow us uh, at CMC here in Asia through, through our um, uh, different social media channels and email lists to to get to know the company. I think they're doing great work. They're in the middle of drilling, and um, and I think it's it's one company definitely to keep uh, an eye on. Uh, and Rob, I maybe just by way of introduction, I I actually heard from Peter that he's known you since uh, you were basically a kid. Is that, is that uh what's what's uh what's that story? Yeah. Yeah, so um, Peter's probably known me longer than I can remember knowing him um, since I was a, a little chap and yep. him and my father go way back in the mineral specimen industry I and see. have that collectible mineral specimen side of things. And so I had the good fortune of having 
Peter is one of my kind of key mentors ever since, you know, university days and as, and, and same thing with Brian, um, cause we met in university, you know, the co-founder of Relevant Gold Corp. And Peter was uh, one of those great mentors that gave us a lot of blunt, um, realistic advice that, mm. you know, provided us with some early stage toolkit, you know, components that I think a lot of other young geos maybe don't get to benefit from. So yeah. we we're super fortunate to get that exposure, get that honesty, right? Um, as some young, motivated entrepreneurs um, and just get like a good understanding of, you know, some good ways to approach big scale thinking, large scale systems, yep. all that kind of stuff. So yeah, Peter's That's been it. instrumental in kind of our approach to how we think about these large opportunities. That's fantastic. And, and so you went to school for geology. Yep. So both Brian and I studied geology at Winona State University in Minnesota here. Um, kind of went off to do independent consultancy as geologists. Yep. Worked predominantly throughout Canada um, on a variety of different commodity types and, and different companies, all different sizes. Eventually formed our consulting firm, Big Rock Exploration. Um, and we really focused on, you know, providing services to the major miners mainly getting a lot of experience and exposure to yep. tier one deposits, how they're discovered, how they get taken through the, the kind of the development cycle. Um, and really, again, continuing to kind of build our knowledge base and ability to attack these things in a very fiscally responsible way, as well as, you know, doing true exploration science. Oh, that, that's very, that's very good. And, and so what, what year did you think about starting relevant gold? Um, so and, we really and sort of what, what was it? What was the motivation? Yeah, no, the, the catalyst was really um, scientific literature and data. Mm -hmm. uh, we we're starting to build new concepts for large scale gold opportunities in the United States. Yeah. And some of our geological team had, had really started to put some unique concepts together that had connected the Abitibi gold belts to the Wyoming gold belts. Yeah. Um, you know, kind of in the academic literature uh, through some tectonic reconstruction work and age dating. And that's where it really started to open things up for us probably about five years ago. Um, and then, you know, we slowly started to chip away at this thesis, really doing what folks like, you know, Peter and Ron and Sarah yep. and those that are on our board taught us, which is, you know, really try to do negative exploration, mm -hmm. um, you know, try, to, try to prove the thesis wrong in a way. Yeah, uh, and keep going until you can't. And so that's kind of where we started. Uh, fast forward to today, and now we've got one of the largest established kind of exploration packages out there. Um, we're working off of this new Abitibi um, yeah. potential thesis, and it's uh, you know assembled into a very nice package of five district scale assets. Excellent. And the and I was reading about how. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the Wyoming was one of the jurisdictions in the in the world that received the most exploration dollars is, is that is that correct um in the, in the last couple of years you know it's i don't know for sure if it's if it's yeah. the most exploration dollars um but what i can tell you is that it's been rapidly increasing and in it's kind of attraction largely because it's a great place to operate um not what, what, not what was the uh, in the mineral endowment but is it is is was there any catalyst like uh, any ease, ease like the regulation became easier or it really was just a case of like you know this has been overlooked and and with gold prices going up people are just sort of uh, putting their attention there. Yeah, I think there's that, and I think that you know we're starting to need to think outside the box on where we can go to find large scale yeah. deposits. Um, yeah. But largely, I think it's a jurisdictional thing. It's a it yeah. really is a great place to operate. Um, we continue to see that as we develop our programs. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of support both from the local community side, but also from the government agency side and the ability to kind of um, actually get out and test your targets and not get Excellent. into a permitting purgatory just to test some yeah. concept. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and if you can imagine a thesis with this scale of implications is also going to take a lot to test. We've got a yep. lot of targets. We've got to systematically test these over time. Okay, great. Great. Um, okay. Well, listen. Um, maybe with uh, this introduction, why don't we have an opportunity to have you walk walk us through the presentation? And then, uh, as uh, Giselle said uh, in the intro, if anybody has any questions, uh, please send them to us, and we'll uh, ask them here at at the end.
Um, as Jorge mentioned and, and Joselle mentioned on the intro, thank you for that. Appreciate it. Really appreciate you guys having Relevant Gold here today. Uh, they, as they mentioned, I'm Rob Bergman. I'm the CEO of Relevant Gold Corp. Uh, we are a Canadian gold exploration company developing projects in Wyoming. Uh, currently, we are trading on the Canadian Securities Exchange under the ticker RGC. Um, and we'll get into the, the story now. As you can imagine, we're an early stage exploration company. Uh, as with that, we may have forward looking statements and, and seek safe harbor. But in reality, these are high risk speculative investments. We take that very seriously. And we try to do as much scientific work as we can in the foreground to mitigate as much of the early stage risk as we can. Um, but with that, we'll get into really the value proposition. And ultimately, we think we've got a strong one. We've got a very well-rounded team, uh, everything from our board through management and technical advisors and our boots on the ground staff. Uh, and we're focused on this idea of unlocking a potential mega district, specifically with Abitibi like potential. And, and we touched on that in the intro a bit, and we'll get into the crux of that thesis and, and why we think Wyoming is a great place to be looking for these orogenic shear hosted deposits. Uh, based on that concept, we've established a very large land position and have multiple projects permitted uh, with numerous drill targets kind of teed up to test over time. Um, and you know, ultimately, we've also identified these, these long linear shear zones at surface and identified very high grade gold associated with these shear zones, um, surface assays returning up to exceeding five ounces per ton, as well as visible uh, kind of coarse gold identified at surface across some of our projects. Uh, and as we mentioned before, we're doing all this in the state of Wyoming, and Wyoming is a great place to operate. Uh, Fraser Institute recently bumped it up to the number two spot on its policy perception index. And again, we, uh, we would agree with that rating completely, uh, largely evidenced by the fact that we already do have multiple permits in hand, and we've been able to kind of go through those for full EAs in, um, on average, about six months, which is pretty incredible. Taking a look at our capital structure, we're very tightly held. We've got about 50 million shares uh, out. Uh, we listed August 11th, so just over a month ago, and we actually did a non-offering prospectus. So we raised the capital ahead of time as a private placement and then did a non-offering prospectus direct list. So we raised uh, just over $5.6 million at about 35 cents Canadian. Um, our market cap has been kind of stabilized in that range, which has been nice uh, since listing, especially in kind of the tumultuous markets. Um, and we've been kind of stabilized at that 17 to $22 million market cap. We've got a very well-rounded board of very accomplished folks. Uh, Dr. Peter McGaw, as we mentioned before, being a mentor of Brian and mine, um, but also a board member, an active board member on Relevant Gold Board, bringing a lot of that insight on, again, these large scale systems. Um, Ron Parrott, Ron Parrott's also led the discovery of um, millions of ounces in Nevada and has ultimately founded and developed a number of mining companies through the sector. Sarah Weber is the CEO of C3 Alliance Corp, which is a, a consulting group out of Vancouver that focuses on indigenous relationships, community relations, ESG, and things like that. Um, also has a background in geology, so really understands the story and the context and, and gets behind that as well. And then you've got myself as the uh, additional board member to Brian Lentz, who is the co-founder of Relevant Gold and our chief exploration officer. Taking a look at our management team, Again, I'm the CEO. Uh, Brian is our chief exploration officer. We've got Mahesh Leonaj as our CFO with an outstanding career and experience in publicly traded mining companies. Um, Sam Siebenhaller, ex-Newmont, he's our VP corporate development, has a great understanding of how these things get taken from concept through the production lines. Uh, and then Chris Jensen, who heads up our investor relations and he's our VP of corporate communications. Um, we have a pretty outstanding background of working with majors and learning from majors on kind of what a tier one deposit is. And these are just some of the examples of the groups that we've worked with over the years. And in addition to that, we take a lot of pride in the fact that we we, we, we operate at a very high capacity uh, in a very safe environment and try to make sure everybody returns home safely. So we're really proud of that. Our technical team, we've got a very strong technical advisory board, Dean Peterson, He's the chief geologist at Big Rock Exploration. He actually did his PhD in the Abitibi Gold Belts, and we'll kind of touch on that a little bit later in the presentation. 
Dr. Kevin Chamberlain. He's out of the University of Wyoming, and he's actually one of the main authors that has connected these dots of connecting Wyoming to the Superior Province during that critical time window uh, and did a lot of the tectonic reconstruction and age dating. Um, so we're really happy to have on there. Uh, Dr. Steve Allard, he's actually a structural guru. Uh, and unfortunately, I, I'm very sad to say we lost Steve um, to the battle of cancer about a week and a half ago. Um, and so he is no longer with us, but his, his legacy kind of continues to live on. And, we're very fortunate that he was able to get his boots on the ground and provide a detailed structural look uh, at the rocks out there. In addition, we've got Dr. Tom Campbell. Tom is the co-author of the Encyclopedia of Minerals, um, but he's basically spent his career in these orogenic gold systems, working as a senior exploration geologist for Homestake Mining, and then for Barrick, both at the Homestake Mine, as well as up at Hemlo uh, in the Abitibi Belts. But ultimately, what we really think is interesting is Wyoming. Ultimately, we've come up with this thesis that Wyoming could be a potential unexplored Abitibi gold belt. So during this critical time of deformation and mineralization, which is about 2.6 to 2.7 billion years ago, the Superior Province and the Wyoming Province were connected at that critical time envelope, which is when you had your gold endowment come in. And then later at 2.1 billion, you had your tectonic rifting that shifted these two uh, geological provinces apart and rotated them to the present day state. So it's really under this kind of overarching concept and idea um, where we started to say, okay, well, if, if the scientific literature is pointing out that these things were connected during this critical window of gold mineralization, then Wyoming potentially has large belt scale, Archean belt scale um, orogenic systems to test that have likely been overlooked in the past. Um, and so that's kind of where we started and ultimately you know, came up with this idea that there is potentially a mega district to unlock out in Wyoming. As we know, the Abitibi gold belts are one of the most prolific gold belts in the world, producing well over 200 million ounces. Um, and really our new model connected the Abitibi and, and Wyoming at that critical time of mineralization. So based on that, we put our boots on the ground and got out and started kicking the rocks, uh, put together a detailed criteria of what we may wanna see to be able to go after Wyoming under this new concept. Um, and we were able to check all of the technical boxes, which was great. But in addition to that, we were able to check a lot of other development boxes. There was open and permeable land. There was a clear navigable path to permitting both on a, on a uh, exploration side as well as on a mine development side and a lot of support there. And obviously we had these through going Archean belts with littered with uh, all different types of deposit styles, orogenic VMS, copper nickel PG, um, uranium, so on and so forth. Uh, so really that, you know, again, the only thing we weren't able to check was this idea that there wasn't much modern exploration, especially with this thesis in mind. So when we think about an orogenic gold system, so we've got, you know, in order or in orogenic system, you need three critical things to basically create a opportunity of scale. Ultimately, you need a deep rooted fluid source that's enriched in metals. Um, and then you need a pathway, you need a structure or suture zone that taps into these deep rooted fluids and allows them to upwell into the earth's crust which is where you get your third thing, which is your trap, your favorable host rock and or your kind of ancillary structures off of your main suture zone. What we see in Wyoming and across our property packages is this very high grade gold associated with these shear zones at surface. Um, and now we need to test this concept of, is this truly an orogenic system at depth? And from there start vectoring towards opportunities of scale. So as we assembled our, our property portfolio, we put together five very large district scale packages. What we mean by district scale is quite simply in the orogenic world is that each one of our property packages has the, the scale and size to host the largest known orogenic deposits. Um, ultimately, these deposits that are tens of millions of ounces. So each one of our property packages has the ability to host that footprint. Another one of our kind of foundational principles is Archie's rule. And this is one of these things that, again, Peter has really helped to kind of drill into our heads since college. Um, and it's because it's a very simple concept. To be economic, a deposit must have a recovered value of two times the all-in operating cost. And the simplest way to achieve that in the gold space is by focusing on grade. High grade typically results in higher margin, higher profitable mining opportunities. And in the gold space, those are the orogenic 
shear hosted deposits. From there, we put our exploration strategy to work. We generated these opportunities through our new eyes on old rocks approach. Uh, we got our boots on the ground, did the technical reconnaissance to validate the targets and acquire the ones that rose to the top. And from there, immediately went into our systematic exploration where we were able to ultimately do all of our groundwork, detailed um, geological mapping, detailed structural mapping, um, ground geophysics, soil surveys, you name it, and start to develop really high quality targets to then get out and test, really working towards this opportunity of, a, of new potential discoveries. So as we look at Wyoming, again, it checks all the boxes. We have shear hosted gold mineralization throughout Wyoming related to these through going Archean belts. Um, along those belts, we have a lot of historic mining uh, of all different types of mineralization styles. And we have very high grade gold proven at surface. Again, samples, uh, rock chip samples exceeding five ounces per ton and abundant visible gold at some of our, our properties. Um, and all of this in Wyoming where we continue to prove it's a great place to operate. So we've got these five major property packages, the Golden Buffalo and the Lewiston. Those are our two kind of flagship assets um, that have had the most work done. And we're currently drilling on our Golden Buffalo project as we speak. So taking a look at this kind of overarching thesis, this is actually from the literature. So this is from uh, Chamberlain et al. 2006. This is the figure from the literature. And you can see this would be the Wyoming province. You can see these large east-west anastomosing uh, shear zones cutting across the entire state, very similar to what we would expect to see on an avid TV analog. We focused here on the Oregon Trail structural belt, and we've established two major camps, the South Pass Lewiston camp and our Bradley Peak camp. Again, all of which continue to check our orogenic shear hosted um, criteria, as well as continue to, to have stronger analogs to the Abitibi thesis. So looking at our South Pass Lewiston camp, this is our flagship district where our two flagship assets, the Golden Buffalo and Lewiston assets are. Um, again, we've, we've, we've made a concerted effort to basically tie up the vast majority of, of operable ground out here. Um, and we were do, able to really consolidate almost the entire camp. Um, and this is this is quite a stretch. This is from a, over here in our South Pass area over to our Lewiston area. That's about 30, call it 35 to 40 plus kilometers. Um, so this is a very big area. Um, and we continue to, to tie that ground up because we kept identifying these shear zones with high grade gold associated with it and continued to check our thesis boxes. As we kind of continue to poke, peel back the onion layer, Try to get a better understanding of how do we make sure we're getting the right ground uh, and really teeing up opportunities of scale. We were able to apply a lot of what Dean Peterson did in his PhD. So he, in, in the 90s, had studied the Timmins, Kirkland Lake, and Hemlo Gold Camps in the Abitibi Belt, at which time they produced about 110 million ounces. And he was able to basically identify that almost all the gold, 99% of that gold, occurred within a six to seven kilometer buffer of your major suture zone, so i.e. your Dester Porcupine Fault, if you will. In addition to that, 98% of all that gold was specifically in Rydell P shears. And not to be overly technical, that's simply a measurement of the angle to the main suture zone. Um, they're split into two classifications, P's and R's. And basically, 98% of all that gold was found within a six kilometer buffer, specifically in P shears, not in the R shears. So as we apply that insight to the South Pass camp, as we really work towards establishing this camp across the entire um, spectrum, you can see these black lines. These are our major suture zones, our major bounding faults. And you can see that with the greenstone rocks bounded on either side. The, the blue in here, this is our miner's delight formation. So that's our favorable host rock. That's the, the rock that the gold is gonna like. And the dashed red line is a, is a seven kilometer buffer to these major suture zones. So very quickly, you can see we're able to tie up the vast majority of opportunity throughout this entire camp across these four district scale projects. Um, and in addition to that, we've been able to continue to do our groundwork, continue to map, uh, and Dean Peterson's out, been out there mapping last year as well as this year with our geology team and continues to identify that our high grade gold at surface is associated with these P shears. So we continue to kind of get more and more of that abitibi confirmation. So taking a look at kind of our flagship asset and where we're drilling is Golden Buffalo, very high grade shear zone at surface. 
but you can see how unassuming the ground is out there. Um, it's it's very unassuming. These are these are these near vertical uh, exposures um, in the shear zones, and the Golden Buffalo project is ultimately, as I mentioned, very high grade, uh, abundant coarse gold at surface, kind of bonanza style gold. Um, this was discovered through some local prospector who was metal detecting and had found a significant amount of nuggets, hundreds of nuggets metal detecting. And that kind of focused them in on this zone. Later than the next operator who was Golden Buffalo mining, they went out and dug this trench, um, approximately 20 meter trench and produced around 500 ounces of gold. And that's where we started to see this, this coarse gold at surface. Um, and so, you know, Relevant Gold, we were able to get a deal done with them and they've been an incredible partner and continue to be an incredible partner on this project. And this is what we're drilling as we speak. So this is basically in the, in the center of this cross section line. This is where the historic trench was that they mined in 2020 and produced that gold out of. Um, ultimately, Dean and the geology team have been out mapping and since have identified uh, over a kilometer strike length of this anastomosing golden buffalo shear zone at surface, as well as a number of stacked shear zones to the north and south of our main golden buffalo shear zone. Again, continuing to, to identify the right type of structural preparation and architecture uh, to support an abativity thesis and an orogenic shear hosted style deposit. So we've moved on to drilling now. We started our drilling program congruent with our listing and we're kind of off to the races in the middle of that program. We've got 31 pads permitted across this site, really designed to test this shear zone at depth. Does the shear zone continue at depth? Does it continue along strike? We really need to be able to understand that this is a deep seated orogenic scale system. Um, and from there, we, we can start to vector towards uh, deposit opportunities. Keep in mind, this area has never been drilled. There's no historic subsurface information. So we're literally the first ones to see this rocket depth uh, and start to put together the puzzle of, of what's controlling the gold we see at surface and where might, might we go to find that deposit uh, of scale at depth. So quick glimpse of what that looks like from a conceptual model. We've got these shear zones. This is our main golden buffalo shear zone. We've got kind of parallel shear zones. Uh, in a compressional environment where you have the rocks getting compressed together and smashing together like this, you have your shear zone forming like this, but you also have it moving up and you form these, what we call extensional veins. And so we've got these kind of extensional veins um, that we identified in the Golden Buffalo Trench. And so we're also testing the concept of do these things repeat at surface? What do they look like? Um, are they mineralized? How does that associate to what we're seeing in the primary shear zone? So again, really this program is designed to, to prove that this shear zone does continue at depth um, to hundreds of meters and along strike upwards of a kilometer. Um, and that's really where we're starting. In addition, we're looking to step out and start to test these parallel stack shear zone concepts uh, as we move to the north there and understand what their implications are on what we see at the surface. And yeah, so with that, you know, again, we, we really think minerals are the future. We see ourselves as the next generation uh, focused on unlocking a potential mega district in Wyoming. We've got a very well-rounded team of value creators who know how to take these things from concept through discovery and beyond. And we've established five very large district scale properties with high grade gold at surface, um, all through a data backed generative approach, uh, which we kind of call our new eyes on old rocks approach. And so with that, I'd say join us for the next big discovery. Fantastic, that's a great, great presentation, Rob. We do have a few questions. So, you know, maybe let me just open them here. And, and um, so one question here is, um, you know, what uh, would success in this first stage of exploration look like? And how many meters are you drilling at, at what depth? Yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful question. So really what we need to see for success is kind of, as I mentioned, we need to see that the orogenic system indicators exist. So we need to be able to prove that this shear zone really does extend at depths. It's not a local brittle thing that's scavenging gold from something yep. else. We need to prove that this is a through going orogenic style structure, both to depth and along strike. So that's kind of one of our first kind of critical path items. In yep. addition to that, we also want to prove that these uh, additional shear zones that we've mapped to the north, these parallel sets, we need to understand what, if those continue at depth as well and mm -hmm. what 
you might see from a veining and kind of, you know, how, do, how does this rock interact? Again, keeping in mind that right now we have no image of the subsurface other than conceptual modeling. Yeah. Um, so these are the very first holes. So our main goal is defining the structural architecture because that's what controls these large scale deposits. From there, we've got the tools we need to start vectoring towards a true opportunity of scale at depth. But yeah, proving that shear zone extends, you know, and, to 300 plus meters and, 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 and a long strike. And what, what, how, maybe you, you, you know, the, the question had a, a second, uh, you know, how many meters and at what depth, but maybe to expand on that a little bit, maybe you can talk a little bit of, you know, what, what uh, uh, you know, and, and in this kind of er, uh, early stage district scale exploration, Yep. Um, maybe it's a good opportunity for you to share, you know, because sometimes you, you might not, uh, you know, hit the spectacular uh, grade on the first hole, but obviously what the kind of rock that you see uh, is, uh, you know, in many, in many senses, uh, just as important, if not more. To, to yeah. Create. Yep. And that, that's exactly it. So we're planning to drill about four to 5,000 meters, depending yep. Um, you know, seasonally windows, uh, we can operate year round, but we cho we're choosing not to drill through yeah, the winter. Uh, it can get pretty rough out there. Yeah. So, you know, that'll be our biggest kind of hold up on how much drilling we get done. We're yeah. drilling at a great pace. So we're getting a lot more footage than we originally anticipated, which is great. Right. Um, but yeah, we're shooting for about 4,000 meters uh, up to 5,000. And again, these will be drilling anywhere from call it a hundred meters to about, I think probably the deepest planned hole is about 500 meters. Yeah. Um, these are, are these maybe, vertical, vertical holes? These are, these are uh, angled holes, not, so we're, we're basically drilling yep. at different inclinations, different azimuths um, so that we can really define the architecture, taking right. that true approach. Um, right. And so understanding that system is key and proving that that orogenic system is really there at depth. Um, again, that's kind of the, the first and foremost. So that would be step one. Um, ideally, if we get some really great intercepts, that's great. We'd love to see yep. that. Um, but we don't feel we need to see that. Yep. We need to see that this is truly an orogenic system. You got to keep in mind, when we look at an Abitibi comparison, the average Abitibi deposit takes yep. about 70 to 80 holes before a discovery intercept is made, right? And so, and they're going at it with a lot more subsurface insight before they yep. even start poking those holes in the ground. Um, so we would be foolish to think that our odds are going to be tremendously better by any means. Um, but we are doing everything we can scientifically to, to kind of narrow our odds and, and maybe and maybe just to test our targets. Just to, to help us uh, sort of get oriented, you know, when we do see, uh, you know, the press release with the results, um, you know, what, 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 are, what should we be looking at for, you know, as signs that, uh, that the, the thesis is stacking up and it's, it's making sense? Yeah, definitely. No, so really what we need to see again is we need to see that structural preparation at depth. So yeah. we want to see that main golden buffalo shear zone because that at depth to, like I said, multiple hundreds of meters, uh, 300 plus meters of depth so that we know that this is really a through going structure and we need to understand what the interact action of other structures are. So that's kind of key. But a, in addition to that, we need to see fluid evolution, right? Yeah. You, you, as, as it kind of took you through the, the story of what does an orogenic deposit look like, we need not only the uh, pathway and the, the host, but we need the fluid evolution. So we're going to want to see complex quartz veining um, with, you know, different alteration assemblages, uh, associated chlorate, actinolite, these types of things that really prove yep. to us this is an epigenetic system. This is an open system that has had a long-lived uh, fluid evolution. All of those things combined together are really indicative that we are truly in one of these orogenic systems of scale, which we do believe we are. Um, and then from there, like I said, we, we can really start to narrow in on what is controlling gold in this orogenic style system? What do we see at surface? What do we see at depth? How do those compare? And where does that ultimately point us? Does it point us to one of our other dozen targets that we already have teed up and ready to test? Does it point us 20 meters to the east. We don't know yet, right? Yeah. But that's that's kind of the approach is doing that true scientific work to, to prove this thesis first and foremost, which again would be just proving that this orogenic system really is there, um, that we see the, the right fluid evolution, that we see the right structural evolution yep. uh, to host a deposit of scale. And from there, you know, we've got an incredible team of technical experts to really start driving towards discovery. 
Excellent. Now we have a, uh, another question here. So for, for organic gold in, in this part of the US, you know, when you talk about uh, focus on grade, what kind of uh, grade are you looking for? And, and also are you looking, uh, is it typically uh, an open pit situation or more an underground or a combination of both? Sure. Um, you know, with this type of deposit, it can definitely be a combination of both. Most typically, though, they eventually go underground. Um, high grade systems, narrow systems that are near vertical. So in the Abitibi, these deposits extend upwards of two plus kilometers into the earth. Um, so that's that's kind of one key thing to understand. The other component then is, you know, could it be open pit? Could it be underground? It could be a combination of both. But the grade component is what we see in these systems is typically a grade that might vary from, you know, call it um, a quarter gram to a gram, and then really get the high grade zones, which are 10 grams plus um, per ton gold uh, and multi ounce potential. Um, and in these systems, you typically see ultimately pods of that bonanza style gold that's extremely ultra high grade, uh, but the vast majority of the system is disseminated um, kind of more moderately high grade gold. Right. So then we have another question here. So for the orogenic gold that's been found in the project, uh, does it mainly occur in veins, veinlets, or is it disseminated? What type of what type of host rocks are in the project? Are the tectonic movements that originated this mineralization? Um, do you see them coming from east to west, and and how deep do the shear zones go? <laughs> so that's, that's a retail a retail investor out there. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a that's a lot of a, a lot a lot in one question. But basically, yeah. to simplify it, we see both. We see the vein hosted gold. We also see disseminated gold. It depends on where you're at in the district, right? At Golden Buffalo, we've seen very high grade gold associated directly with the veins, um, specifically with the extensional veins intersecting some of the shear zone veins is where some of that bonanza stuff was pulled out of um, historically by Golden Buffalo. And, you know, but whereas over at the Carissa mine, which is one of the uh, most prolific mines in the district, produced about 180,000 ounces on record uh, in the late 1800s to the early 1900s. And the vast majority of that gold was fine grain disseminated gold. Um, they were able to recover the vast majority of it through, you know, gravity fed processes. Um, so a lot of free gold in the system, which is great, but still fine grain disseminated in some of these areas. Um, as well as the high grade vein hosted. So we do see a variety across the camp, um, depending on where we're at. Uh, but the host rock, yeah, that is fairly homogenous. It's, it's, again, it's kind of all lumped together as this miner's delight formation, which is ultimately a meta gray wacky sequence. So we see kind of our, our you know, silts and muds and, and we see some subtle differences and changes in politic content. Um, and, you know, we see some strain partitioning in the shear zones. So that's, you know, again, that's, that's our favorite host rock. That's what we want to see. Um, that historically, for, to my understanding, has never, they've never kind of, they don't know the true thickness of it. It's in the, in the, his, you know, geology literature, they talk about could be upwards of 10,000 feet thick. They don't really know. Um, but what we know is that it's definitely a big package and unit. As far as how deep do the shear zones go, well, that's that's exactly what this initial grow program is is out to, to understand, is how deep do they go? Do they go hundreds of meters? Um, are they really deep-rooted suture zones that have kind of had a long-lived open system uh, environment like we think they would in a transgressional environment? Um, and so, you know, that, I don't know if that answered all the questions within that one, Jorge, but, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, very we're, good. we're hoping to see these shear zones pretty consistently. Um, you know, they're near vertical. We want to see them to hundreds of meters of depth at a minimum on this first drill program. And we'd also like to extend them at depth along that strike plane, too. Excellent. No, very good. And I guess the last question is, uh, uh, can, can you show again the, the district scale? Uh, sorry, the, the, the slide that you have, the, I think, the five different district scale projects. And do you mind giving us a little bit of color on that? And I mean, I understand you're just focusing on one project now, but is yeah. any, any work being done in the other ones? And sort of what's what's uh, what's uh, the 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 plan for those? Yeah. So right, we've got this is our Lewiston package here. This is our Golden Buffalo package. Um, and this is our Shield Carissa and Windy Flats. So these are the four in the South Pass camp. 
We basically, we're focused on drilling Golden Buffalo right now this year. We have a permit for our northern uh, section of the Lewiston here, which is our North Star and Heavy Hand targets. Um, also extremely compelling targets, uh, but had to pick one to start with. So we started with Golden Buffalo. We've got a lot of high-grade gold at surface at both of these. Um, we're working on a permit as we speak for kind of the south central portion of the Lewiston project. That's in progress and we should have that in the coming months. So we'll be going into next year with three permits in hand. Um, and in addition to that, we are doing a congruent regional mapping and sampling program um, so that we can continue to generate more and more uh, of a pipeline. Our goal is really to truly systematically test this concept across all of the properties um, because they all merit you know, have the merits that warrant true exploration. Um, so we are planning on continuing to tee up a pipeline of permanent targets to go after um, and, and ramp up as we go. And as we start to understand more about the subsurface and can paint a clearer picture on how we might more appropriately target those across all these zones. Great. Okay, great. Well, I think those are all the questions we have now. I thought that was a great presentation and, um, well, thank you very much for making the time to introduce your company to us. I think you know, it's very exciting what you're doing. And uh, when do you think that you might have uh, drill results? I imagine probably not until end of the year or next year. Yeah, that's exactly right. We're, we're hoping for end of the year, we'll probably trickle into next year, depending on lab right. processing times, which as we know, have been a little bit slower than we, we all would probably like, but at the end of the day, that's just part of the process right now. And it, yep. you know, we, that stays the case and we keep getting exploration dollars going into the ground, right? So. Right. Oh, well, let's, let's have you back here uh, for an update once the, the drill results are out. And you know, in, in the meantime, thank you very much. Best of luck over there. And, um, and thank you everybody for, for tuning in. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for having us. Thanks for you know, hearing the story. And thanks a lot, Joselle, for setting everything up in the intro. And, thank you, Rob. Yeah. Appreciate the conversation. Thank you. And then uh, hopefully uh, at some point we have you here in person. Yes, that'd be great. Soon enough. Okay. All Thank right. you, everybody.